a time to hear and think about God's word. Before we hear God's word, let's pray. God and Father, as we listen to your word this morning, please remove our unbelief, confusion, and disobedience. Help us to encourage one another so that none of us is hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Please produce in us the fruit of your spirit. Amen. Now Romans 8, 1 to 17. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. Because what the law of Moses could not do, because the flesh was weak, God has done. God condemned sin in the flesh by sending his own son, who came as an offering for sin, so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who no longer walk according to the flesh, but who walk according to the spirit. Those who are of the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who are of the spirit have their minds set on the things of the spirit. The mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. The mind set on the flesh is set against God because it does not submit itself to the law of God and obey it. In fact, they cannot obey the law, and that is why they cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If Christ lives in you, the body is dead because of sin, Yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of God, who raised Jesus from dead, death, lives in you, then he who raised Christ from the de death will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit. So then, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but not to live according to the flesh. Because if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Those who are led by God's Spirit are the sons of God. Because you have not received a spirit of slavery that leads to fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption, and as sons we cry out, Abba, Father. God's Spirit himself testifies with our own spirits that we are children of God. And since we are his children, we are heirs together with Christ. If we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, if I haven't met you uh, yet, if you're visiting today, my name is Omar, and I'm one of the ministers here at church. Uh, we're really all ministers. Ministers means servants, so there's many of us here. Uh, just an apology for my voice. Uh, early this week, I woke up and I sounded like Sean Connery, which was uh, really good, actually. I thought, I wish I could sound like this all the time. Uh, but since that was Thursday, I've sort of lost that. Uh, sorry. But my voice isn't quite right yet. Now, today we're looking at this idea of life and what that looks like after condemnation is gone. Okay, and what that could look like. So how about we begin by praying. Uh, Father, we thank you that you save us from that very dark, dry place where we live separated from you, uh, under your condemnation and also under other people's condemnation and perhaps under even our own condemnation of ourselves. And we thank you, Lord, that you save us from this through your Son and give us a new life. 
And so we ask that today as we look at this chapter, which is very difficult, please help us, Lord, to begin to see what that life, after the condemnation is gone, what that life can look like. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, friends, one of my favourite parts of the Bible is the story that we find in John's Gospel, thank you, George, which is where the religious leaders, the Pharisees, take a woman to Jesus. And the Pharisees, the teachers, you know, they test Jesus. They say to Jesus, look, we caught this lady in the very act of committing adultery with a man. And they test him by saying, teacher, should this woman be stoned to death like the law in the Old Testament said she should be? And at first, Jesus doesn't really answer their question at all. Instead, as you can see in this photo, he sort of, you know, bends down and he starts riding on the sand. After a while, he stands up again and then he says these most incredible words to everyone who is there. Thank you, George. He says this, Whoever among you has never sinned, let that person throw the first stone. And then John tells us that everyone stood there in silence. And slowly, very slowly, John says that people started to leave. Beginning with the older men who were standing there with rocks in their hands, people began to leave. The older first, then the younger, until finally it was only Jesus and the woman standing there together. But that story gets even better because then Jesus says the most amazing words to her. Thank you, George. He looks at her and asks her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, no, sir, no one. Jesus replied, then neither do I condemn you. Now go and sin no more. And friends, what this story tells us is that when there is now no condemnation, the right thing to do is to go and sin no more. You see, this is an opportunity that Jesus presents to her. It's not a threat. This is an opportunity. Once the condemnation has gone, you have the greatest opportunity in life to go and sin no more. And what Jesus is saying is that really the only smart thing to do when the condemnation is gone is to go and learn to live a new life where the sin that used to rule over you no longer rules over you. And friends, that is the greatest opportunity any human being can ever be given. To live a new life with Jesus without condemnation. And back here in Romans chapter 8, which we're looking at today, Paul is actually talking about the same sort of thing. You see, in Romans 8, or the beginning of Romans 8, Paul is describing what that life looks like once the condemnation has been taken away from you. You know, if you trust Jesus, you've received the forgiveness he offers to you, and now you live your life with him, well, Romans chapter 8 is describing what that life looks like. Because God no longer condemns us because Jesus took our condemnation. And because condemnation is now gone, what Jesus said to the woman, he says the same thing to us. You have an opportunity now. You are no longer under condemnation, so go and learn to sin no more. Live your life with Jesus with no condemnation. Learn to live a new life with Jesus Christ in your life where there is no condemnation. And really, I want to talk about three things that I think Paul says here in Romans about that life that comes once condemnation is gone. 
And the first one, thank you, George, is this. Paul says, now there is a new power available to us in this life. Look at verse 1, thanks, George. Paul says, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. Because what the law of Moses could not do, because the flesh was weak, God has done. God condemned sin in the flesh by sending his own son who came as an offering for sin so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who no longer walk according to the flesh but who walk according to the spirit. Now that's a real mouthful. And it's you know, quite difficult to understand what Paul is talking about. But I think the basic Point that Paul is trying to make is that now, once the condemnation has gone, now there is a new power that is available for people who trust Jesus. There is a new power available to us that was available to Jesus. Now there is a new power source that we can connect into and take into our lives as we learn to live our lives with Christ without condemnation. And incredibly, this power that is available is the same power that was in Christ Jesus 2,000 years ago. You see, as people back then watched Jesus in action, what they saw was a supernatural power working in him to produce things, supernatural things, to do things which normal people can't do. And in verse 2, thank you, George, uh, Paul, you know, calls this power the law of the Spirit of life. That is the power that was working in Jesus, the law of the spirit of life. Now, what does Paul mean when he says the law of the spirit of life? Well, the first thing to notice is it's a law. But it's not, Paul's not talking about the Old Testament law. Because here in this verse, when Paul says law, he means a pattern, an established, ongoing, reliable pattern of life that people could see in Jesus as he walked around and did what he did. And that reliable and powerful pattern of life that lived in Jesus was of the Spirit. In other words, it was the Holy Spirit who was in Jesus enabling him to do what he did. And he, Paul says, the work of the Spirit in him produced a life. It produced a kind of life that is different to normal human life. And I think what Paul is trying to say here is that because Jesus had the Holy Spirit in him without limit, the Holy Spirit produced his fruit in Jesus without limit. And this makes sense because Jesus was always continually filled with the fruit of God's Spirit. Things like love and joy and peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Jesus always overflowed with these things because he had the spirit without limit. And people could see that in him. That's why they were attracted to him. That's why they followed him because he had this life in himself. He had this power, this source of power, the law of the Spirit which produces life. 
But notice here that this power that Jesus had in him, alive in him, also worked to set us free from another type of power. Thank you, George. And Paul calls this power the law of sin and death. And again, notice it's a law. It's a pattern. It's an ongoing pattern of life that is alive in all people. But this time, the fruit of that power is not that good. And if you read Galatians chapter 5, there Paul tells you the bad fruit that that power of sin alive in people produces. And the list is not a good one. Paul says things like sexual immorality, impurity, lust, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, selfish ambition, division, envy, drunkenness, and get this, things such as these. It's a long list that this power that is at work in people produces. And Paul says, if we live with that law, that pattern of life, then without even thinking about it, without having to try anything different, we will end up in one place. One place only. Death. That's the fruit of that power that is in all people. But friends, the good news is that the power of of life that was alive in Jesus through the Holy Spirit defeats and conquers that life of sin and death that lives in us and, as we learned last week, lives in our bodies. Jesus defeated that dark power during his life, uh, in his death on the cross and in his uh, resurrection. And so Jesus now frees us. He has the power to free us from that power. The power of sin that leads to death. And really what Paul is saying is we need to unplug from one power source and we need to plug into a new power source. That's what he's saying. We need to unplug from the old power source where we excluded God from our lives, where we relied on our own abilities, our own power, our own wisdom, our own strength, and where everything was under the direction of our own desires. We need to unplug from that. And we need to plug into a new power, a new power that Jesus Christ makes available to us through the Holy Spirit. And that power enables us to live in God's power, with God's wisdom, with his strength, and we place our desires under what God says is good. And please notice, friends, that the purpose of this, the reason that Jesus you know, gives us his supernatural power through the Holy Spirit, the one reason that Paul says here is this. Thank you, George. Jesus does all of this so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who no longer walk according to the flesh, but who walk according to the Spirit. Now, friends, here in verse 4, when Paul says law, he is talking about the Old Testament law. Because earlier in Romans, we saw, Paul said, the law is good. And the law is very good. It shows us how to love God with our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And it shows us how to love our neighbor as ourself. Which shows us that obedience is a very important part of this new life with Jesus where there is no condemnation. And the reason is, when we obey, 
Only when we obey are we actually experiencing that pattern of life that lived in Jesus. It's only as we actually are obeying God that we are experiencing that law of the spirit of life that worked in Jesus. That's an opportunity. That's not a threat. You get to live with Jesus in the way Jesus lived, with his thoughts, his feelings, his actions. That's what Paul is saying. So the first thing that Paul says here at the beginning of Romans chapter 8 is, there's a new power source that is available to people who have faith in Jesus. Now, the second thing that Paul says about this life that we live once condemnation is gone is this. Thank you, George. Number two, walk by the Spirit. Look at verse four. Thanks, George. Paul says, we no longer walk according to the flesh, but we walk according to the Spirit. Those who are of the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are of the Spirit have their minds set on the things of the Spirit. The mindset on the flesh is death, but the mindset on the spirit is life and peace. The mindset on the flesh is set against God because it does not submit itself to the law of God and obey it. In fact, they cannot obey the law, and that is why they cannot please God. Now, friends, I want you to look at these verses, and I want you to try and work out what the most important thing that a Christian needs to do if we want to walk in the Spirit. Just look at these words. What's the most important thing we need to do? Well, it may surprise you, but the most important thing we need to do if we want to walk in the Spirit is to think. That's the most important thing. We need to think. We need to focus our minds and our attention on God, on who God is and what God is doing in this world and in our lives. It's to consciously keep turning our attention back to God, to his work in the world and in our lives. It's to seek to rely on him in every situation as we live this new life with Jesus without condemnation. Friends, that's what it practically looks like to walk in the Spirit. And it all starts with what you think about So let me ask you, what do you think about? How do you spend your time? What fills the minutes and the hours that make up your day? What do you think about? And, of course, the opposite of this is also true, thank you, George. This is in verse 7, because there Paul says, there are people who have their minds set on the things of the flesh. And flesh doesn't mean just your body. It means your own natural abilities, your own thoughts, actions, strength, knowledge, desires. That's how People live. They set their minds on those things. They focus their attention on those things. And really what Paul is saying is that these people have no time for God. God's not included in what they're doing. They give no attention to God. They think they're in control of life, and it's all up to me to do what I can with what I have. That's people who live in the flesh. And Paul says, you know, if you just do that, 
There's only one place that you'll end up. Death. And of course, these people can't please God because they don't know God. I mean, how can you please anyone if you don't know them? You don't know what they like. You don't know what they don't like. How can these people please God? They can't. It's impossible. They don't know God. So that's the second thing that Paul says about this new life when condemnation is gone. You walk by the Spirit. Now, the third and final thing I want to talk about this morning, thank you, George, that describes this life with Christ once condemnation is gone is that we have an obligation. Christians have an obligation. Look at these verses, thinks George. So then, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation. But not to live according to the flesh, because if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Now, friends, one of the big mistakes that Christians make is they try to go toe-to-toe with Satan. Some Christians do that. They try and, you know, face their sins head on. These are the people who, you know, so focus on their sins, they give all their attention to their sin and they try really, really hard not to do it. But friends, that doesn't really work very well. And if you've been a follower of Jesus for you know, years and years, you know that doesn't work very well. Going toe-to-toe with Satan is not very helpful. Indeed, there's only ever been one person in the whole of human history who did go toe-to-toe with Satan, anyone. And that was Jesus. You can read all about it, Luke chapter 4. He goes out into the wilderness to be tempted, and Satan tempts him three times. Jesus goes toe-to-toe with Satan and wins. Jesus is good enough. Jesus is wise enough. Jesus is holy enough to face Satan head-on and to win. But in case you didn't notice, we're not Jesus. And if we try to do that, the chances are we will fail. You see, the problem is when we concentrate and give all our attention to not sinning, what happens is you focus all your attention on the sin. And that means you're too busy not doing something wrong to do something right. And that doesn't work. It won't help us walk in the Spirit and to live a new life with Jesus Christ without condemnation. Now, I know this is a bit weird, maybe too much philosophy, psychology, but I want to give you an example, thank you, George, of how this works. Now, what I want you to do is to focus all your attention on this pink elephant with white dots. Don't look at me, look at the elephant in the room. Focus all your attention on this pink elephant with the white dots. Okay, you got that? Now I want you to close your eyes. Nothing bad will happen. Close your eyes. This is a safe space. Now that you've closed your eyes, whatever you do, don't think about the pink elephant with the white dots. Don't think about the elephant. Try not to think about that elephant. Will you stop thinking about the elephant? You see, it's very difficult. 
It doesn't work because at the moment all you can think about is the pink elephant with the white dots. And the only way to change that is to focus on something else. Thank you, George. Here's another picture for you to look at. Focus your attention on that. The elephant is gone. And so it is in the new life with Christ. We have been freed to focus our attention on something new. We've been freed. There is no condemnation. We've been freed to now focus all our attention on the Spirit, on the things of God. And Paul says it's an obligation. You've got to do it. If you don't do it, you'll keep thinking about that pink elephant. It's an obligation. We have to focus on the new, the things of the Spirit. And only then will we overcome that sin that so easily comes to us and that is in our bodies. And really, Paul is saying if we just concentrate on doing that, just keep focusing on the things of the Spirit, the Word of God, God Himself, His character, His goodness, what He's doing in this world, God's people the presence of Jesus in your life, as long as we keep focusing on that, all that old stuff will just wither away and die. Very slowly, it will lose all its power over you because you have a new power working in you. The law of the Holy Spirit that brings God's life into your life. And that means over time we will love God more and we will love people better. But the secret is to focus on the new. And that's why Paul says it's an obligation. If you don't do it, that elephant will always be in your life. Now, friends, here in Romans chapter 8, that's what Paul is describing, the new life that comes to you after condemnation is gone. There's a new power. You walk in the Spirit. And you focus your attention on living by the Spirit. It's our obligation. And so I just want to finish with these words. Thank you, George. Verse 14. I think this is beautiful. Look at what Paul says. Those who are led by God's Spirit are the sons of God. Because you have not received a spirit of slavery that leads to fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. And as sons and daughters, we cry out, Abba, Father. We cry out, Dad. That is the new life because condemnation is gone. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that you have such wonderful plans for us, not just in the future but now, that we would step out of the condemnation, that we, we would understand that we are not condemned because of Jesus. Lord, help us to leave that old life behind by plugging into the new power of the Holy Spirit, of your word, even of your people. Father, please help us to focus on something new, something better, you in us doing your will in this world. And we ask this, Lord, for your glory and for our eternal good. 
And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as usual, we have a discussion question. There's a few parts to this. Which of these three is the most important to you right now and importantly, why? The first one is, there's a new power available to you. We walk or live by the Spirit and we have an obligation. So which one feels important to you right now and why? You have five minutes. Father, we thank you for the great joy it is for us to bring things before you, especially together as your people. And we thank you that it is a great joy for you to receive our prayers and to do with them what is good. And so we ask, Lord, now that as we do that, that you will take our weak words and that you'll mould something good from them and do your good work in the world and in our lives. Amen. Our dear Heavenly Father, um, we bring before you the situation in Gaza. We pray that a ceasefire and peace will come, uh, that the killings will stop, and that people uh, will turn to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord, you have said in your word that in the last days you will pour out your spirit on all flesh. I cry out to you from the bottom of my heart, Lord, that you will pour out your Holy Spirit on these, your precious children and our families. I pray that we will hear your voice talking to us, that we will listen and learn your truth, the truths that you have for us in Romans and in other places. Help us not to grieve the Holy Spirit, Lord. And if we have wandered away from you in any way, please take us and draw us back. In Jesus' worthy name we pray. Amen. Dear Lord, thank you for your goodness and for your love. And Lord, we pray that every day we can go out and do good and that we can do it for your glory and for our good. Amen. We thank you, Lord, that you are our good shepherd. And we thank you, you don't stop working in us to make us good sheep. We need your work in our lives to keep us uh, growing and, 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 and closer, closer to you. Help us to remember we don't walk this walk alone. It's a walk that we walk with you and when things go wrong help us not to look at uh, what's going wrong but help us to look for you because you're there you promised you would never forsake us you would never leave us we are your special project and you ain't giving up you ain't giving up on us Give us strength. Grow that hope in us that we would never, ever give up on you. That's not who you are. <coughs> Good shepherd. Shepherd our hearts. Heavenly Father, the fruit of the Holy Spirit is always around us every day. Every day we wake up, every, every morning, everything we do in life is, is all, all attributable to you, Lord. Give thanks and glory to you, Lord, always. And we shall live a better life and a fulfilled life in which you envisage, I can't pronounce it, sorry, envisage in the first place. Thank you so much. Amen. Lord, thank you for removing the condemnation that was above us. Thank you for removing the condemnation that we place on others and that others place on us and that we place on ourselves. Thank you that in Jesus all this is wiped clean when we trust him. Help us, Lord, to learn to walk this new life with him. Teach us. Help us to teach each other, to model it, to graciously and gently help one another so that we become more and more like your son. 
And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.